Hey, then, hey, Chip, wait. Can you take your glasses off or something on them? No, there's not. Yeah, yeah, take your glasses off. Yeah. And if you just pull that down a little bit. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. In the last few years, we visited some pretty cool spots, several of which were actually old mills. But the old mill in Pigeon Forge is the only one we visited so far that is still fully functioning, just as it was back in the 1800s. Well, my name's Jimmy, and I've been here at the old mill for about 23 years myself. And uh, I work in marketing, and I've done lots of things around here, but I'm known as the old mill historian. So, um, so that's why I'm talking to you today. Give you a little history on the old mill, um, just the, the area in general, and then uh, and then let you all explore. Awesome! So here we are at the Old Mill, which uh, uh, has been here since 1830. So there was a father and son team that built this area up, and that was Isaac and William Love. So um, Isaac built the Iron Forge in 1817, and that was located right about where the general store is today. Of course, a little bit closer down to the river. We're just slightly up above the river right now. And then uh, one of his sons, William, and his brothers built the mill in 1830 and William became the, uh, the first miller. That's why we know more about him. Uh, I'm not sure what the other brothers did, but uh, became the first miller. And then around 1847, um, or, or, or sorry, early 1840s, uh, he became the first postmaster. So Pigeon Forge got its name literally right here inside the mill. And he named it for his father's iron forge and the pigeons that would roost along the, uh, the river here in the, in the trees. The mill itself is, uh, has only been owned by seven different people, seven different families over the years. So um, their father and father-in-law and grandfather was Mordecai Lewis, who came down from Virginia, uh, in the, from the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, and uh, followed John Sevier, who was Tennessee's, known as Tennessee's first governor. So let me show you the door right here. This is the original door that would have been on in 1830. And notice all the nails and the tacks and the holes all in the door. This is where the, uh, the, all the announcements, the news of the day, the birth, the death, the off to war, coming home, church revival, community picnic, school starting back up, whatever was happening uh, was posted here on the door. Even most wanted, because like I said, um, William Love became the first postmaster and that's where you found all the, the most wanted posters yeah. were um, at the post office and the post office was located just inside the door here. So, so I love the story that this door alone could tell, you know. I'm Chuck, I'm the head miller. I've been here for 12 years now. So it's, it's been a unique experience because this is kind of different than anything else you're gonna find. While it is an old mill built in 1830, it's still very much uh, a business that we're operating and working and running every day. And what I like to do, I like to tell folks, welcome to the beautiful downtown Pigeon Forge back in 1830. <laughs> this, this was downtown Pigeon Forge. It's, Kind of hard to wrap your mind around that we didn't have all this other stuff around here. This was it. This was where everybody was gathering. Uh, he showed you the door and gave you the history on that. Well, they had to do something while they were waiting for the drain. So this is where everything built up. Then they built the bridge and then things went off from there. So it's kind of a unique thing that we got here. But all these bags you see uh, that are stacked up everywhere, we fill by hand, tie these by hand, weigh them by hand. And we're gonna do about 100,000 of these a year. And we've got like 43 products right now that we're currently doing, and we're going to add a couple others. So it, it keeps us on our toes, as you can imagine. That many items in multiple sizes. Most common sizes are two and five pound bags, and a few items we'll do with 25 pounds as requested. We call this the main rig. These are water-powered stones. Uh, this is really exactly the way they would have done it back in 1830. This is the second set of stones that we've had here. The first set are out front, you can look at those. So since we've been here since 1830, and this is only the second set, it shows you they last a long time. Uh, the biggest fear is sometimes they'll clank together and they would chip or crack. That's what you don't want. If that happens, then you, you would have to replace them. But what happens, we'll send the corn up to the third floor with the grain elevator, which I'll show you in a minute and it'll feed back down by gravity into the hopper. Then it feeds down in here. This thing is gonna jump a little bit, feed it down into the middle, 
this top stone's going to turn and the grain's going to come out the front. Now we'll let it fall into a box unless we're doing what we were doing this morning, which is make grits, and then it'll go through a pipe, go up behind you, go to a big sifter, and then come back down that pipe behind you. I tell folks to look for two words, uh, enriched and enhanced, especially as they pertain to whole grains because if they got the word enriched or enhanced, they're taking something out, they're adding something back, and I'm like, why are you doing that? If it's a whole grain, you don't need to do it. Just grind it, leave it alone, it's good to go. That's the grain elevator. It goes very fast. It? it does. Well, it's supposed to. That's the main power rig. Right. You see that diagram there underneath the water about 12, 14 feet is where that turbine sits. All the grains that we grind are very much subject to heat, humidity, or cold. So the heat, the humidity, and the cold all play a role in how a grain will grind from day to day, even hour to hour. Uh, today it's maybe a hair finer than it was yesterday. But that's one of the unique things about our cornmeal. It's not going to be exactly the same every day. We try to get it as close as we can for consistency. But you could get one bag that's maybe a little more coarse and date, it's a little finer. But that's the way it's going to come out with what we've got. This is where you would make your refined flour, you know, your all-purpose flour, your self-rising flour. Uh, it's made by a company called Savage & Taylor out of Knoxville, Tennessee. Now this company made this equipment so well that they basically put themselves out of business. Once they saturated the area, uh, there wasn't anything else for them to do. The modern equipment is bigger, runs on electricity, when all of this was simply water power. But what they would do is they bring it into the first unit, and if you feel that, there's no spiders in there, I promise. There's no spiders in there, I promise. <laughs> if you feel that, the first one's rough, so all they're doing is just barely cracking the grain, just barely. And then they would send it upstairs to a big sifting machine, it would shake it, it would bring it down to the next machine, and they do the same process again, only this one, as you feel it, is very smooth. So now they're grinding it finer, and they send it up again, and again they sift it. They bring it down to the third unit, which is the same thing as this one. And again, that final grind, then the final sifting. And flour, it's all in the sifting. The more it's sifted, the finer it's sifted, the better flour is going to be. And then once they had their, their all-purpose uh, flour done, they would take some of it, set it aside, add a leavening agent to it, mix it up, and then you have yourself rising. And when we get really cranked, our, our busiest part of the season goes probably from September to the end of the year. We do almost half of our business from the milling standpoint in that period. So it's what I call the crazy, I don't like even talking to these people because I'm busy, uh -huh. leave me alone. Uh, ask them, of course they say I'm cranky all the time, but. <laughs> I get cr I cranky, er, you put an E and R on the end of er, I get cranky, er. But it, but it keeps us really hopping and just you know, keeping things like the bags up. Because if we need to bag some, then we have to stop and make the bag, it slows your process down to almost a crawl. The employees that work in the mill are few, but specifically selected for their passion, skill, and determination. Because y'all, it's not easy work. So once we fill it and it's weighed and we take it off the scale, we're gonna make a tail. Okay, we're just gonna cinch the top as tight as we can. We're gonna take a piece of string and what I call skip a rope, I flip it over then I cross it over like we're going to tie your shoe, put your finger straight down, just lift it up. Go back around your tail, back through your hole, pull it tight. You want to pull it as tight as you can so you cinch the top as well as you can. Now in the cold weather, cinching is it's much more complicated because your hands are cold. And everything we do is by touch and feel. So you don't want that rope to slip because it, it, can, it can cut you if, you if you do it too often. So when you're doing these, you just want to go, do it, bam. Throw your string over, over, boom, bop, ding, boom. And if you can do three, four hundred of those a day, Take then the you, you can. Can you take your glasses off? There's something more. No, there's not. Yeah, yeah, take your glasses off. Yeah. And if you just pull that down a little bit. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. See, now I gotta do it all by feel. Voila. <laughs> Originally, this section was a two-story building that was added on here. 
the first story is about, I mean, the second story is about where the first story is today. This, the first story was below the ground level where we're at, closer down to the river. So that was built somewhere around 1900 or shortly before 1900. Uh, there have been a couple of uh, large floods that have come through and done a lot of damage to, uh, to the area. The first one was in um, 1875, and that first flood um, washed the wheel off the, the front of the building, washed out the bridge that John Sphere Trotter had built with wood from his sawmill. So that first bridge that was there, built in 1857, I believe, um, it was commissioned uh, by, the, by the county. They decided to ford the river in seven places, and this was one of them. Tourism really started for Pigeon Forge in the, uh, the mid-1950s, uh, right in there. So in, 18, or in 1940s, the National Park was formed, and President Roosevelt had come through and dedicated the National Park. And after that, tourism started building for Gatlinburg quite a bit, but it was still pretty quiet here in town. So the first tourist-based business for Pigeon Forge was actually the pottery we're going to go to here next. So that was built in 1947, opened up in an old tobacco barn, and that tobacco barn was 100 years old when they first moved into it. It was built by John Sevier Trotter, who was the second owner of the mill. So he had his farm here, and uh, so he was the miller, he was the, uh, the sawmill operator, he had a farm here, so he was, he was a busy man himself. But um, uh, so they opened up in that old tobacco barn and in November of 1957, that barn caught on fire and burned down. So what you see today is the rebuild. They rebuilt and opened up by June of 58 and, uh, and then they operated. Um, that was built by the, the Ferguson family and uh, Douglas Ferguson operated until um, his death in 1999. And after that, the family decided to sell the, the building. They didn't sell the business though. So they wanted to keep his legacy as it was, which we understand. We, we have a legacy we, we're building ourselves and you know, we want to remember that history and that legacy there, but we want to build um, our own as well. Those hinges were built to squeak from the day that they were installed. So Douglas Ferguson was actually an engineer by trade. He wasn't a potter by trade. He married into uh, a family of potters and learned the trade and became very well known for it, very, very well known for it. But he was an engineer. He designed this door and designed the hinges so that they would squeak. When somebody came in, you would know somebody was there. Exactly. So if he was back in the studio working, he knew when a customer came into his business. So as before the, the laser sensors and the bells over the door and that kind of thing, he didn't use any of those. In addition to the pottery shop, there's a distillery, ice cream shop, candy store, general store, kitchen store, and Sassafras, the clothing boutique. The mill also offers two sit-down eating options, the Pottery House Cafe and the Old Mill Restaurant. But you'll have to wait until tomorrow to hear about them. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a single video, y'all. And thank you to the Old Mill for sponsoring this video.